in, and we're starting a, a discussion today with, we have a number of mobile app uh, experts or people who are kind of working in the field, and one of the things we're going to start off is just uh, an introduction about what they're doing in this space, and so uh, who, whoever wants to go first, who'd like to go first, introduce yourself, tell us kind of what you're doing in the mobile app space. Yeah, I'll go. Hey, it's uh, Jonathan Egernis, and uh, in addition to being Dale's previous neighbor, um, I work on mobile apps kind of in two ways. So one, my day job, I work on the product team at Vantex. Um, so that's you invest in the uh, brands of professional athletes. So we do both Android and iOS. And then about six months ago, I started kind of thinking about developing my own app uh, as we had our first baby, so actually getting ready to submit that uh, tonight, hopefully. It's called Air Bear. Why don't you go ahead and tell them a little bit also about uh, Fantex and uh, your experience and what you're doing there. Yeah, so you know, essentially we're creating this new marketplace for a new kind of equity where people can invest in uh, the brands of professional athletes, so we'll do a deal with... Uh, uh, with different players, and then they'll agree for a one-time payout to um, provide a percent of their income. And so essentially it, it's kind of the NASDAQ meets E-Trade in one uh, kind of new asset class. So uh, focus mostly on our website and, and mobile apps that, that touch our users. And I just realized I'd muted myself. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, your baby app and kind of how you came up with the idea, if you're ready to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you know, it was about six months ago that we had our first baby, and um, I knew very little about babies. I think a lot of guys are kind of like that, and people just that are having babies later in life. And I found that there are a ton of baby apps, but they were all just terrible. They looked like iPhone 3, just kind of crappy, clunky, ugly, and just way too much stuff going on. So... Um, I knew there was a good opportunity there, and then the other piece of it was I've never had been a developer for my day job, so um, I knew Apple just came out with Swift, and I just kind of set out to, to learn it and see if I could actually create an app. So I spent a couple of weeks or a couple of months kind of studying and learning, and then probably the last two or three months were kind of just nights and weekends been been coding and, and developing it. So so really I wanted to do three things with that. One is just very clean, simple interface. Two is I wanted people to to know very simply what was the last thing that happened and what came next. You don't need this full list of feedings over the last few weeks and months. That's all you really care about is what was the last feeding that happened and when's the next one. And so I focus on that. There's lots of ways to go with diapers and health and milestones and getting other things involved, but you got to start somewhere, and you just want to start with a very simple app. And then the third piece, which is uh, just have some fun. And, um, you know, if you're up at 4 in the morning and you just did a 40-minute feeding, I think you should get a little high five. And so that's kind of the, the third piece <laughs> of it, is to, um, to have some fun with it, where you're not just writing down in a notebook 40 minutes on the right side. You know, there, there should be some interaction. So I try to... Um, develop in some some animations and some fun copy that kind of bring that to it. So, um, getting ready to submit this evening, and then uh, I know, depending on the the iTunes wizards over there, um, hopefully it'll be live uh, in a couple of days. Well, that's awesome, Jonathan. I always laugh at when people say I slept like a baby because don't babies wake up every few minutes and crying, you know? So it just just doesn't really fit for me. So, all right, who um, who's next? Tell us a little bit about what you're doing in the space and uh, what you're working on. Uh, who wants to go next? Sean, you want to go? Sounds good. Uh, my name is Sean Murphy. I work for my own company called Better Hour Tomorrow. Um, do a number of web applications. We've done a, a number of mobile apps, and as Dale said earlier, uh, all through PhoneGap development platform. Um, it's allowed for kind of single page application, quick push out of Android or iOS um, applications. Um, done a couple for in house projects. Um, 
one for like a research institution and just a video, game apps, so just a few here and there, but all through PhoneGap. Um, mainly was a, like a web application developer, be able to use uh, like jQuery, CSS, Ajax, um, bring them all together, and PhoneGap basically allows you to use those skills and integrate it into the mobile app platform. And over the last few years, as Adobe's kind of um, bought out what was PhoneGap, and I guess they now call it Cordova, but everyone still calls it PhoneGap. Um, you know, they've gone through some changes, and they've, they've made a lot of, like, the transition interfacing and things like that a lot smoother. That's kind of allowing, from what I understand, PhoneGap to kind of creep up into the marketplace of the apps being developed and pushed out versus people developing directly in native. Um, gives you the uh, gives you the option to include native app and native code, but if you wanted to, you could do everything through uh, just regular HTML5. Hey, Sean, why don't you, for our listeners that may not be as familiar with PhoneGap, and I know at the restaurant the other day, the other day you kind of gave us a layman's definition of kind of phone gap. Why don't you do that for, for our listeners? A layman's definition of phone gap. A, in the ideal sense, it would be a single code base. I claim seven platforms. Um, I've only really used um, Apple iOS or Android. Um, but in theory, you could use the same code same interface, basically say compile Android, compile iOS, compile Windows, so on and so forth. Okay. So kind of my analogy I always thought of was kind of WordPress is to blog development what uh, phone gap is to developing apps for multiple platforms. It may not be a good analogy, but that's one of my thoughts. Dan, you want to uh, kind of give folks um, your your background and some of the things that you're involved in? Well, my most recent accomplishment, I think I jacked up my the, the Hangout thing here. I pressed a button, added an app, and all of a sudden I'm really, really badly pixelated where I used to have HD, um, you know, quality video here. Well, anyway. We, <laughs> we could fade to black. We've done it before, Dan. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've crashed Google before a few times. So, anyway, I'm Dan Harley, and um, I've been a longtime programmer. Um, um, my forte, actually, I built 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 process control systems for water companies for a long time, and a seven language programmer and process control programming and PLCs and stuff like that. And I'm actually entering my twentieth year and in doing internet stuff. I just realized my first website was built in back in uh, 1995. So. And I've been doing, you know, web design, internet marketing, SEO, internet solution consulting for quite a while. My recent, my recent, um, you know, uh, I got quite a few things going on right now, including getting involved with the hotel of all things. In fact, I was, I was involved with a partnership meeting, and I look like I'm a, I'm a third partner in a new venture of getting a hotel of all things. But um, I'm also getting domaining and and um, uh, website flipping and stuff like that too. So. That's me, <laughs> and not to mention that Dale and I have been doing a a blog talk radio show that was rather successful, and we are I think our last show was uh, fourteen fifteen hundred live listeners. I still don't know why we're listening to us, but we had that many people. So, well, my only role was to make fun of Dan and make sure he defined things in terms which most normal people can understand. So we did have a couple of prank phone callers, which I always thought I was telling Sean about the other day. But and I, uh, Drew, are you still with us? I see kind of uh, yeah. muted. All right, why don't you yeah. uh, you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of what you guys are working on? Sure, sure. I um, I work on basically building uh, mobile apps or mobile experiences for uh, clients. Generally, we'd say. Uh, Small small companies uh, around maybe anywhere from like three to twenty some employees basically uh, where we've kind of found that uh, often outsourced software development firms uh, internationally tend to have very affordable or very low seeming prices but uh, 
often service isn't so great, uh, and that's not necessarily the norm, but just from personal experience, uh, Drew, that, that happened a few times. Drew, could I interrupt you for a second? I noticed sure. that your your video is just showing your picture, and it might be because there's a either your bandwidth has been affected or you've changed a setting up there that uh, gives you the lowest version. So all we're seeing, we're hearing your audio, but we're just seeing uh, your hoodie picture. And that's yeah, fine. It's, yeah, it's, it's a bit choppy, and sometimes killing the video can help with that, so I, I turn it off. Okay, it's all good. I just want to make sure you knew it. Yep, yep. Okay, so it, it keep going. So, uh, yeah, basically uh, I'd been burned a couple times online and had some friends who'd had similar experiences. And then uh, sometimes uh, domestic firms tend to have really good service but also can be quite expensive, um, often in hundreds of dollars. And for a small business or a smaller company, that can often take a project out of budget really quick. And so we like to kind of position ourselves as a domestic level service, but with a price point in between domestic and international firms. Or we, we think we provide really good customer service in terms of creating mobile apps anywhere from design to publishing in the store while um, helping our customers understand what goes into a mobile app. These are generally not the most tech-savvy consumers as they're outsourcing in the first place because they don't have the expertise. So basically, uh, that's kind of what we focus on is uh, small, smallish type businesses who realize the value of mobile but might not have an in-house team where they can just churn out apps like a large company. Oh, okay, I got a master kind of taking myself off mute. Thanks, Dan. You know, one of the things I wanted us to talk about kind of as a group is where we're, uh, what opportunities that you guys see in the mobile app space and how you go after business and if you had suggestions of what has worked for you well in the past and just kind of an open dialogue about, about the space. And um, I'll, I'll start off. I know that Apple released earnings today, and I think, Pretty soon you're going to see the uh, watch. I don't know what your impression is of that, but whether it be Fitbit or, or watch technology. And I was talking to Sean this week about, you know, one of the things I see is that there probably is not a lot of experts in that space. So that's kind of a, a new thing. It's kind of emerging. And I was wondering if any of you guys had plans to uh, move in or do anything that might be um, iWatch uh, related. Um, or anything else that you see in terms of where the market is headed and uh, opportunities that that may, that may provide. So, um, just anybody that would like to take any of those first, uh, let me know, and I'll give you the floor. Well, I actually bought myself a Pebble for Christmas. Here we go. And um, I tell you, I'm quite impressed with it. And um, actually, before I bought this, I looked at different um, watches. The what was was to be Apple and the Samsung and everything else, but um, got handed down. Pebble has it has it uh, has them all whipped. Um, it's not just the watch, but it's also the applications and everything goes along with it, and also being cross-platform compatible. So where this goes, watch-wise, is um, actually the sky's the limit. Um, how are you How are you using it right now, Dan? Right now, right now, it complements my smartphone. So if I have, let's say, a text message, I get a little jingle on my on my watch. Uh, it tells me that you know my, you know, somebody just. Te in fact, my my cut my nephew just texted me, and I got no idea where my phone is right now. So um, it saves me from you know pulling my uh, basic stuff. It basically it saves me from pulling my my um, my phone out of my pocket to go check my text messages and stuff like that. And it goes a step further here too. I actually have a uh, a smart thermostat in my house, uh, a Nest, and I, I can literally control it from my from my wrist wristwatch through my cell phone. So um, nice. I've been uh, considering a, a Nest purchase, but haven't um, made the transition yet. Um, so great. Anybody else? Um, any of those uh, kind of where it's headed or what you're doing? And I, I, I let me also say that I, I'm. 
in my third semester of teaching at SMU in their Guildhall School of Video Game Production where I work with aspiring uh, video game producers. So I'm getting that experience and learning a lot. I'm trying to learn more about a Scrum and Agile and how it fits into kind of some of the traditional things. Um, in terms of opportunities, one of the things that I identified is, and Dan and I have talked about this on prior shows, is the use of a Flippa. And Flippa is kind of like an eBay for uh, websites and for apps. And I'm constantly kind of looking at Flippa to see what opportunities there might be there. Anything that might have up to a six month payback, I'm kind of looking at perhaps acquiring certain other apps that might uh, fit into my portfolio and I'm constantly kind of looking at those things and sending them to a few of the guys that I have a relationship with that kind of give me their impression on. So that's kind of some of my thoughts. Uh, who'd like to go next? So on the, on the Apple Watch, I'm really looking forward to playing with it first as a lefty. I'm curious how that little dial is going to work. It seems like it's built for right-handed people, so I don't know if you can just turn it around and it works, but just kind of that whole interface and the dial. Um, and it, It's kind of one of those things where I think you need to play with it to see how good is it. And I think you got to give Apple the benefit of the doubt, but um, anyway, something you got to tinker with. As far as the use case, like for AirBear and feeding and, and just kind of how two apps work together, I think it makes a, a lot of sense for that easy one-to-one -one connection, but... Um, I think as people get these more and more, kind of the more interesting thing is what's just, how is it better than just a second screen? So I'm sure you can see a text that you could have seen on your phone, but what's really that really interesting use case where you're like, okay, I, I totally have to have this. And so I, I think where that fits in is not quite, not quite established yet, but it's just, you know, it's still early. Yeah, I guess you're talking about what it goes from novelty to being functional. And um, quite honestly, this Pebble has become very functional very quickly, I, and I didn't think it would. I thought it was just a glorified watch. But it, 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 it may not seem much, but not having to pull your, your phone out just to see a, you know, a, a, a text message or if you have, like, Google Maps going on, it actually gives you, gives you your, your, your navigation around the phone. Sure. Uh, and I could actually go in and you know send out simple uh, t uh, responses to my texts, text, and, and uh, even goes a step further. Actually, there's like um, about nine thousand, ten thousand apps on Pebble already. Oh, wow. And also, I should add too, this works on Android as well as um, as uh, uh, iPhones. So it's only it's only watch is cross-platform compatible. The Apple's the Apple watch is only going to be for iPhones. So. Uh, Dan, is that uh, Bluetooth? Is, does it kind of connect with your device through Bluetooth? Yeah, Bluetooth. Is that the way it Bluetooth. Okay. Um, one of the things that I see is we're just right on the cusp of, I think, something great. One of the things I think is a huge opportunity is in monitoring of medical issues and conditions, especially people who have diabetes that are having to prick their fingers all the time, that if we can kind of create um, apps to monitor uh, their um, blood sugar levels and some other things that I think might be um, kind of what the future holds. So I think we're just kind of in early on about what we're doing with these uh, watches. Uh, we do know that people are comfortable wearing watches and so uh, and, and it, it opens up an opportunity for high margin businesses. I think Apple's already looked at you know, brought in some people who've worked in uh, jewelry and, and, and high-end fashion and kind of turned it into a fashion statement. So, all right, any, um, have, have any of you guys that, that are here, have you uh, began working or, or developing um, the skills necessary to, to work on iWatch? I know there's a developer kit. Have any of you guys looked at it? I, I'm... I've looked at the, just in general the the UI health kit, um, and it, it's pretty cool. I think that's where, and Dale, I totally agree with just the health implications where, um, you know, monitoring pulse and sleeping habits and just health is, is huge. And, and I, I've been pretty happy with my Fitbit, but it doesn't do kind of that next level stuff. So I think the health is really interesting. Um, 
I know. I imagine like I've seen in in Xcode just more applications or um, references to to the watch. Um, so I think that piece will be pretty easy, and it's almost easier when you have less real estate to deal with. Just thinking, all right, what's what do I absolutely need to show the user um, in this form factor? Um, but uh, and I think. Uh, you know, Dan, you were saying that uh, your Pebble does both. I know Bliss, which is a pretty cool watch that Intel actually acquired, um, I think that runs on both and does some health stuff. So, um, again, you kind of have the same same argument of, you know, what is that ecosystem around the watch to make it really useful? And is it just iOS stuff, or who's going to be building on it? Um, that'll be interesting. Know that Apple has started to work with IBM around some of uh, uh, develop more of the business applications, and I'm not sure uh, to what degree you guys have awareness of the kind of applications that are coming out of that, or if you've seen anything that's come out. Um, but that's kind of something I think that that's a hopeful area, at least for the iOS. And then, any of you guys have any input on that, or or do you have an awareness of the kinds of of apps that are coming out as a result of the IBM Apple partnership. Anybody? I think um, just kind of generally the, and this is probably a bit early to say, but the Apple Watch could kind of be the watch to end all watches in that uh, it's more than just an activity tracker or it doesn't just tell time and uh, the use cases aren't necessarily limitless but when any kind of new technology comes out, a few apps get made, and then a few more might get made, and the total capabilities of it aren't really found until years and years later. I mean, even with the regular app store, like if you have an iPhone, I don't know if you guys remember any of the early on flashlight apps where those were very simple applications. Someone would just make an app that could use your phone's camera as a flashlight, and Apple clearly didn't think of that from the beginning. And uh, now it's default. Any iPhone you buy has that feature. But I think some of those sorts of things are uh, are nearly limitless. And I think the basic ones are just using the watch as a communication tool within kind of corporations would be one of the more obvious version. That's a, that's a really good point, and Dale, to kind of what you were saying earlier about, you know, what are some interesting kind of quick payback opportunities, not necessarily like what is the iWatch app that's going to reach a billion people, but just like what's a iWatch app that could make six figures potentially over its life and just kind of think about those. And um, it is kind of a cool time to start developing those because people will, you know, be kind of exploratory. They'll be willing to spend uh, five bucks or so maybe on a, on a cool iWatch app um, or that complements. So um, that could be an interesting way to think about your, your strategy there. So in terms of new platforms, is there anybody out there that would rather have Google Glass or an iWatch? Google Glass. Yeah. If I could only have one of the two technologies, I'd, I mean, I'd probably go with the Google Glass versus a watch. But I'm not really a watch user to begin with, and I'm probably not at the age yet where I really need to watch my heart rate and sleep patterns. But well, that's 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 a great question. Um, anybody out there? I mean, I I, I yeah. do think that uh, Google Glass. Uh, sometimes you kind of get stereotyped as kind of the glassware, and I. You know, I think there's been some people that got kicked out of restaurants or something because people are kind of paranoid about am I being videotaped or is it, you know blah blah blah. I like the concept, um, and I know that Facebook has purchased, made a purchase. Um, what was the name of the the purchase they made? That's kind of their version of uh, three dimensional uh, viewing. Oculus. Oculus Rift, yeah. You know, and it's kind of everybody's looking for that that platform. So. Uh, Sean just kind of threw it out. Which ones do you like better in terms of uh, do you like Google Glass or do you like the watch or do you think it's that it, there's room for for both? Well, they're not going to sell Google Glass anymore, so I think 
that answers it. Yeah. But, uh, uh, what what led to what led to that a decision, Jonathan? Are you aware of that? I I just think it wasn't it wasn't working. I think they had a cool idea. They're always, um, you know, to Google's credit, just thinking very far ahead. How could we do this? And I think that I'm sure they got technology and knowledge from this experiment, but they realize people aren't going to walk around with this. And so... Um, uh, Google tends to have a little bit more divergent strategy. I noticed where I think they bought 10% of SpaceX uh, this week. So Really? Well, they're yeah. trying to... I mean, that one makes a ton of sense. You know, if you can get satellites and uh, provide internet and get more people online, that's huge for Google. And so that one makes a ton of sense. But I think a lot of the bigger tech companies, uh, Google, Amazon... Um, a lot of those guys are being really good at, you know, running experiments, putting some money and resources behind it, and then if it's not working, just shut it down and move on. Oh, I like the concept of uh, little experiments. There was a book called Little Bets, and it was, you know, how Seinfeld becomes good when he does his comedy things in these small comedy clubs. A lot of things will bomb, but he develops some things where eventually everything works. And to me, yeah. Google's making a lot of, of these uh, little bets. Now, I think in terms of the brain power here, I always like to ask the question, uh, what's impossible to do today in your business that if it were possible, would dramatically change and improve how we do things? And I think that those are the things that, uh, Google and Microsoft and all the technology companies are spending their research and development dollars on, but then there's kind of little L opportunities for all of us in the app field of what are those things that can add value to our clients that they'd be willing uh, to pay for that we could uh, launch some apps to be able to make money in the space and to add value uh, for our customers. So. Um, I know some of you may not be totally want to be transparent with some of the ideas and things that, that you're having, or maybe you are, but uh, anybody want to talk about any ideas or things that, that you've heard about that sound uh, intriguing to you? Well, this isn't really a mobile app, but I want to throw it out there since we just mentioned medical, SpaceX, and impossible things, is there's a medical X prize that's actually out there for... I think it's $10 million for the first person who can develop a true tricorder like you used to see on Star Trek. So, like, there used to be a SpaceX prize. It was eventually accomplished and awarded, and they now have a medical X prize. You know, Sean, I know that you said you're not at the age yet where you're really concerned about monitoring your health. Uh, Suzanne just had a colleague this week that was in her 20s and just fell over dead. There was, and there was no, uh, she was sending a text message to her boyfriend that said, I'm not feeling well. And she never finished. Uh, she never sent it. So I mean, it's. It, but one of the things that's interesting to me is some of these watches and things. Um, I know Apple is hiring some experts to that could listen to blood flow, like the sound of blood flow, to be able to kind of give you some early warning detection that maybe there's a problem. But there are people who seem like they're very in shape athletes and things that have a heart issue or a heart problem and some of you guys may have known you've seen people in the news about it happens to occasionally perhaps technology could identify a few of those folks and perhaps save their lives so anybody aware of or have you heard about other things that might be applicable in, in that space I think even just um, the people that don't have those immediate risks but um, like I can say from wearing a Fitbit it has changed my behavior. And so I think even just from a small factor, you can slightly change behavior or become aware of certain things um, that you didn't. And, and it just kind of ingrains itself in you further. And, and like Apple's taking a fashion approach as well, where they're saying this thing needs to look awesome. We're bringing people from Burberry and all these different companies that are going to make it fashionable, make it gorgeous. And so um, when you combine that with a little bit of functionality, um, I think you start to get a much bigger audience than just the people that are like, you know, I'm obese and I might have a heart attack. You get a lot of people in that space. By well, the way, I, agree. I mean, the concept alone of, say, the person you're talking about, you know, who passed away in her 20s, like, what if she had that watch? That watch was connected to her phone, wherever it may have been. I mean, in that case, it was in her hand. 
But what if it sensed that boom, no pulse, dialed 911, knew the location because location services were enabled? I mean, you just never know. Like maybe that would have saved your life. And there are some creative apps that I've at least heard about where people are trained in um, um, CPR, you know, that in the event of an emergency, before uh, the emergency can get there, uh, it could page somebody who's been trained in CPR. And I've read about, and those that, some of those have been produced um, as freebies. I think some fire departments raised some money to get some of these um, out. And I'm kind of intrigued by that um, space too. So um, any other comments about either the health space or opportunities that you've seen or things, interesting things that you've either heard about or ways to identify possible opportunities? Well, as a rule of thumb, health and medical has always been a huge uh, field for technology. Um, lucrative, even at a small scale. Um, if you got the if if you got the something that'll help somebody, that it, it's somebody's always always willing to try it out and buy it. Um, so, for instance, um, my stuff I do telemetry had been um, actually uh, brought into um, you know you hear about the spacecraft and all like that, but that is really telemetry has really gotten away uh, uh, lots of legs in the health and medical field. So. And that's gonna. I think it's gonna carry on over, carry on over into into any other, especially the the um, the, the micro app field and stuff like that too. So, you know, I always yeah, find I think, it. Uh, okay, Drew. Uh, with the watches and generally wearables, um, people are more willing to invest in a health-based product if it has what ifs. It, whereas a say a, a Fitbit or a Jawbone um, might kind of seem cool if my device can have proven benefits or potentially proven um, benefits. For example, say say you're a mom, right, and, and your child has diabetes, but your, your kid doesn't have a cell phone or the kid might not be old enough to have a phone. And you get them a, an Apple Watch, and the Apple Watch can just vibrate a few times a day, and a notification pops up that says, "Hey, check your insulin. You have diabetes." Like me as me as a mom would love my kid to have that. Maybe maybe you're not there with them to tell them, "Hey, you need to check your insulin," or if they go off to camp, for example, or, or something like that. Um, and that's a that's a very very simple, uh, simple use case and very easy to implement feature. You know, it's just a, a push notification at certain time intervals, but that can be potentially life-changing for, for some people. Yeah, I think that with the outbreak of obesity, so many people, there's so many people and young people getting diabetes that as we can kind of come up with some non-invasive ways to monitor those things and the use of technology, I think, um, would open up a, a huge space for that. So any other uh, thoughts from the group? One at a time, please. <laughs> you know, how do you identify opportunities? Uh, you know, one of the things I do occasionally is I'll go on Odesk and I'll just see what people are asking for, what people are bidding on. Not because I want to be a copycat, but it's kind of a way to take the pulse of the kinds of ideas that people are coming up with, the kinds of things people are working on, um, which might spark me thinking about other things. How do you? So let me kind of throw this to the group. Uh, and I know Jonathan, you probably came up with the idea because you know you, you have a baby and you're into technology and you're just kind of looking for things that you would want to buy, you know, as a new father for for your thing. But for those of you here, uh, how do you come up with ideas, or how do your clients come up with ideas? Um, that might be possible mobile apps. I kind of, I kind of have a conflicting point of view here, where um, I think the you know the best advice is always like, what interests you? What problems do you have? Like solve your own problems. Um, now certainly the case with me and Airbear, where you know I wanted to to work on this and. I was going through those problems, so I, I knew what it what did I want in a product, and 
I've been talking to people and getting advice, but it's still very easy when it, you're solving your own problem. Um, but at the same time, I've seen really interesting examples where people, um, I was listening to a podcast um, where this one guy started developing, uh, he was just kind of looking at iTunes to see what was uh, highly kind of, um, I forget how they rank them, but... Uh, what was selling? He was trying to find out bestsellers? Yeah, looking at top grossing apps and um, they were kind of shitty at the same time. And so he ended up doing a um, Spanish Bible app. And this dude's not religious. This dude doesn't speak Spanish. But he was like, there's an opportunity here. Doesn't care about the space. Doesn't think anything about it. Just kind of saw that opportunity. And now he's making, um, and I think it's, uh, he said on his podcast, like 10000 20000 a month from people downloading the Spanish Bible app. And so... So, oh. Jonathan, Jonathan, let me clarify. Like I don't know. So, in other words, what he was doing was kind of identifying a good opportunity, but somebody who really wasn't effectively uh, meeting that opportunity, which gave him an opportunity. Is that is, is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, so he, he found apps that people were willing to pay for, but were kind of terrible. Got and it. So, um, yeah, he wasn't, like, going after some problem that was being solved really well. He was more looking for what are people paying for where if I did something a little bit better or made, you know, just improve the product a little bit, people would buy mine instead. Um, and so he was able to make a huge business from something that he's not interested in. Um, and he ended up kind of starting another business that he was more interested in. Um, I think it's always nice when you're doing something that, you're, that you care about, but... I mean, there's definitely economic potential for just kind of those opportunistic uh, swoops where you dive in and and take advantage of something. Nice. Well, one of the things I wanted us to get together today is I think there's an opportunity as we all identify opportunities to get each other involved and the way I look at it it's kinda like a pickup game of basketball so you know we might say these are the players right who wants to play and occasionally people on this podcast or perhaps people listening on YouTube might say either I've got an opportunity and they might want to come to this group and and we can kinda figure out which one of you guys want to play or does it make sense and at different times, we might have different players. So one of the things I want to create a group where, um, you know, if Dan's got an opportunity, he can come in and work with a few guys and kind of he takes the sales lead or the sales commission for kind of making that happen and uh, from pull from expertise from all of us. So and kind of you look at look first within the group and then and then if, if, if we can't meet it within the group, we can kind of look at Odesk and, and other opportunities. So. So if you're out there and you hear it and you've got an idea, you know, Dan and I want to have weekly kind of these uh, hangouts on air. So you can kind of come on and, and talk about it. And if it makes sense, uh, we could align ar around uh, big opportunities for each of us. So. And on the topic of opportunities, for those trying to think, what could I make a mobile app to do, um, I'd say most apps have come to us from two premises. One being, um, say you have a lot of data, you have a lot of information, and you, your company, that's what you do. You're like a data miner, um, data gatherer. Maybe you have scientists. Maybe you have researchers gathering this data. And for you, it's like, how do we get the, this data that we're putting all this work, all these man hours into, how do we get it out to people to see and recognize the value in the data that we have collected? And I would say the other opportunities typically when a company looks at what their employees are doing. like What do we ask them to do every day? Is it, um, one example would be fielding simple incoming calls about, hey, we have, you know, this monthly income because we have these mineral rights, um, which in Texas is, is a huge thing. And they have employees that literally answer calls and say, hey, you know, okay, how much are you currently making? How big is your size? The basic information. All this information is just as easily gathered off of one royalty check, just an image. And so they're like, you know what? We can have an app 
do the work in less time than we can pay all these people to do, and it can go out to an unlimited number of Texas, Oklahoma, whatever residents. They can see there's the, a picture of their check stub. We can get back to them and give them, like, you know, an estimate of what we would pay for such things. So if you have kind of mundane tasks, simple tasks that make you money on the big side, make you bigger money on the back end, you know, maybe you can use that, bottle it up into a mobile app, and present it to the world. A great example, um, Sean, and one of the examples I want to give kind of a quick case study for that we were involved in, in this year is there was a, a small oil and gas company and essentially they make uh, oil field prophylactic. So imagine a, a giant truck pulls onto this giant rubber and in the event of a spill it would contain it. But every time they did a job, they'd fill out a stack of paperwork about this thick. Somebody back at the home office had to input it. They had a hard time reading their handwriting. There were mistakes that would get made, et cetera. And what we created is an app where they could have an iPad where they input all of that at the wellhead. Whenever they got internet service, they could upload it back to the home office. Just kind of a, a more effective um, way of doing things as opposed to shuffling a bunch of papers around, right? So any other kind of examples or things you want to tell the listeners um, about opportunities that either you're looking for or ways to partner with folks? Sure, I think kind of similarly to what Sean was saying, there's still tons and tons and tons of business processes that are done on paper and or manually that are cumbersome and you might not necessarily think from the lens of oh what can I make an app out of or what are some mobile app ideas but rather like this is a pain point or, or problem for my business and coincidentally a mobile app is something that could solve that problem or, or solve that pain uh, and it, you may also have software that you already are using that just might not be mobile optimized so for example we had uh, a company we were talking with and they are a software company actually they just don't have a ton of experience in the mobile space and so they've done some work with desktop products and the desktop products have worked fairly well but now with mobile phones being everywhere you might have sales agents in the field with either iPads or iPhones or Android phones and interacting with software on like a four by six screen and that's even a bit big for a cell phone is very different than interacting with a laptop or a large monitor and making that a good experience uh, is often difficult kind of like uh, what I think John was saying earlier about having a small screen on an Apple Watch forces you to realize what is essential for a user? Um, often, often that can be that can be tougher than you think. Um, or a mobile app could could be pretty useful for that, but you might not know how to do it. And that's one thing we can help with. Things I wanted to do is Dan and I. We used to ha do the Blog Talk Radio Show once a week. It was two hours long, and it was really too long. And I want to kind of say, is this is the length of this one? And I'm. It's coming up on eight o'clock, and kind of my goal would be to have it more frequently, but have them short. So is does one hour kind of fit you guys? Does this does this work for you? Is something we could kind of do regular, and I'm not saying that you'll always be on every one, but kind of can kind of pop in and pop out. Uh, does this format work for most of the folks? I find it enjoyable. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, I would like for to offer ideas. If you have other ideas, if you're a listener on YouTube and you have ideas of things that we could address on Technology and Tuesday, please send them. Um, you can send them to me at daleperryman at sbcglobal.net. You could send them uh, to Dan Harley. Dan, why don't you give us your email address? Yeah, Dan Harley at primeconcepts.net. Okay. Any other any other closing comments that you guys have? All right, I'll, I'll take that. I, I, hang on, I think should, everybody should give their shameless plug. 
All right, give us uh, give us a shameless plug. Who wants to start? I, I'll start. Um, My Meeting Pro. Uh, I have a series of apps that help people run simple, more effective meetings. John's going to help me do some updating uh, on that and examine other future features. You can uh, join me at my website at jackofalltraining.com. Um, where I do corporate training and development, leadership development. I've got a course on Udemy on how to build a creative culture. I uh, would love uh, love it if you uh, have any interest in that. Uh, let me know. So who's next? Um, I guess I'll I'll kind of give the shameless plug. Uh, I work um, for Ball and Media, just B A L L I N media and uh, our, our tagline is we make uh, amazing mobile experiences so basically uh, you might have a problem that you don't know what the best solution is and often a mobile solution is that solution or you may have you may just have an app idea but not know how to build it um, and we think uh, user experience or often the, the design and the look and feel of an application is is really important and that's one thing uh, we really stress with our clients. Cool, yeah, and I, I hope to help um, both Drew and Bala do some business development. So anybody else have any shameless plug? Jonathan, you want to uh, do a plug for your app that's coming out? Uh, sure, if you, uh, you have a baby or know someone that's about to, tell them to check out AirBear, airbear.co. Uh, hopefully in the app store soon. And that's A I R B E A R. Uh, air like air, bear like bear. Okay. Like bear. naked bear, or animal bear. <laughs> <laughs> animal bear. Yeah. Or a B E E R, be a bear. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Be drunk in beer. Yeah. Um, I guess my shameless plug would be air bear with the naked bear will be the pivot. That <laughs> that was it. <laughs> nice. that, that'll be that'll be your porn version. All right, Sean. <laughs> we'll lock up that yeah. we're talking about we're good. All right, Sean. Sean, give All us right. your plug. If you're interested in uh, any sort of web application design, mobile application design, um, specifically in the realm that may better our tomorrow, please give us a call because that's what we're here to do. Contact us. We'll get back with you, and we can hold your hand through any step that you need or. Take an idea that's already pre-planned and just make it rock. Well, cool, guys. Well, feel free. I'll post a link and send it to you um, of how you can embed this video in, in your own blog or in your own website. You know, it's always good to do that. Uh, Google loves fresh content. That'll help you all with your search engine optimization. So please do that. And I'm signing off for YouTube. I'd like to thank all of you guys for joining us. I hope you'll... Join us again in the future, and for the YouTube listeners, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you next time. Yay!